Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Tom welcoming you to another study in the Word. I want to thank you for joining me. Again, these videos are not created to be on television, so uh, basically, you probably just want to look at the Word and and uh, take notes. Uh, this is just getting them out there in a way and a format to which people can use them or listen to them. This is our third session in uh, Deliverance, True and False Deliverance Ministries. Um, and what I'm endeavoring to do is lay down solid doctrine for you, solid deliverance uh, principles from the Word of God, and to also expose those things that people are doing that do not line up with God's Word, because it is embarrassing to be around that. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and you got a lot of people out here who operate in dog and pony show type of deliverance ministries, and I don't personally like it. I think it's really, uh, uh, you know, destructive to, to what God really wants to do. And so um, you'll have to excuse me if I feel a little bit upset, but many times um, I've been criticized for even operating over here in deliverance ministry enough uh, to where I have to deal with kooks. If you have to deal with too many kooks around you who uh, say this is the way we do things and, and uh, make a big dog and pony show out of getting people delivered or whatever it is and uh, and everything. I don't like being identified with that. Just like some types of healing ministries over the years, you, you know, or uh, people who are involved in uh, some sort of uh, things they shouldn't be involved in, in, in amongst uh, Pente Pentecostal charismatic uh, uh, places. You know, you, you kind of pull back some of the false prophecy and so when you pull back sometimes saying, well, you know what, I don't even want to be involved in that. But you know, if there's a false, there's a, there's a true. There's got to be a true to have a false. So we don't want to pull back. We just want to expose and we want to see what's right. Now, the next scripture in the Bible, we dealt with uh, several in our last session, uh, is in, can be found in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. Now, last, last time we had just talked about the centurion. The centurion just uh, told Jesus, you know, I'm a man of authority. I uh, understand authority. You know, if I say to one guy under my charge, you go, he'll go do it. Another one, you go do this, he'll go do it. Because that's the way it works in the military. And he said, Jesus, I understand that you have authority. If I can use this term in the spirit realm. And you don't have to come to my house to pray for my, uh, for my, uh, this person. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is speak the word and my uh, son will be healed. And Jesus saw that and, and it took him back. He thought, I haven't seen such great faith in anywhere in Israel, but this heathen comes up with this, you know. Well, speaking the word and speaking with authority to things like demons, sicknesses and diseases and so on is one of the ways, the principal ways that we deal with uh, uh, this type of subject. Uh, many times in a... Uh, prayer line, I will be under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes the gift, the gift of special faith will also be in operation, and the anointing of God will knock somebody down as an example, and all of a sudden, I'll just have a, I'll just have what I call a mini vision or something, and I'll see these evil spirits that are tormenting somebody, and I'll just speak to it, in the name of Jesus, comes out bold and strong, bam, and they'll leave, and that is really um, the gifts of the Spirit in operation which we actually need most of the time to get people delivered. Now, I know a lot of people are going to tell you different. You know, you have to go to counseling and sit there and, for years to get rid of this stuff. I'm going to tell you that it's real important for you to get into the right kind of meetings if you're really struggling in these areas uh, where, you, where you need some deliverance. Um, I have tried to pray for people and have prayed for people on Skype and have had results, but it's difficult sometimes if you're not there, sometimes for the gifts of the Spirit to work in somebody like me, I must be there, lay hands on people, or be in that particular uh, service for it to work right. Not all the time, but sometimes. And I think there's a there, there's a tendency today, and amongst many people I've noticed who need deliverance, that they just they're they're, they're not going to be committed to anything. I'm going to go to church. I'm not going to be involved in services. It's uncomfortable for them to get under around the anointing. That's a key that maybe you do need deliverance. If, you, if it's difficult for you to get into church service where the anointing is moving 
and you start getting very uncomfortable in that, in that situation, that's probably one of the keys that you need to be there because the anointing destroys the yoke. I remember one lady giving her wonderful testimony about how she came out of a, a, a terrible background where her father uh, was involved in black magic and uh, satanic cult. And she was had been raped by her father and by the other people in the satanic cult and, you know, had went out into the world and tried to get away from all this and fallen into addictions and other things. And her life was a mess. Well, finally, she came to the Lord and God did such a great work in her. But for, a challenge for her, a great challenge was sitting in a church service at first. And then after she got able to do that, a great challenge for her was when they took communion, because in the occult world, they took communion too, but it was a, a blasphemous type of communion. And so, it all, you know, when, uh, she, she didn't partake in communion. One day, though, she was sitting there. The Lord said, if you take communion, I'll heal you. She still had a lot of issues. And so she forced herself, you know, it was a, it was a real struggle, but she forced herself to take that communion. When she took communion, she was healed. You see, that's what I'm talking about. These biblical principles are very powerful. Actually, communion can be a great way to minister deliverance to somebody. Nobody ever talks about that, but it's a biblical thing. Remember what I've done for you. Remember what I did on that cross through the death, the burial, and resurrection. Satan's a defeated foe. The Bible says he's been stripped of all his power. Now, in Matthew chapter 8, we see the next uh, place where it mentions deliverance. And the reason I brought in Matthew chapter uh, 8, uh, verses 5 through 13 there with the centurion, was because the principle is so prevalent in deliverance. I wanted to share that. But in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, the scripture says here, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Now notice, when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Again, that word possessed simply means demonized, tormented, could mean a lot of things, could even mean totally possessed. But uh, there can be different levels of that. I just want you to know that. Possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirit, notice this, with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now, the very first thing we see here in the word of God relating to deliverance here, it's interesting, that Jesus cast out the spirits with his word. I made mention to you in our last session that just sitting under the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, just reading the word, just listening to the word, just being in the right place at the right time, many times can be in great deliverance. I've had seen people delivered by just listening to my sermons. I've seen people healed by just listening to my sermons, the word of God, by being in places where the word of God is preached, or by speaking the word themselves, or by standing on the word themselves. This word here, uh, word, though, that's used here is interesting because it's not rhema, the spoken word, it's logos, which really means, in, when, when, you, when you take it in its full meaning, is it's the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Now, Jesus was the living word of God. And so when he spoke, there, there was, there's like, it's like he was throwing the whole word of God at the devil. That's powerful when you really think about it. But the truth is, when we use the name of Jesus, we have the same amount of authority. And so when we speak to these, these demons in the name of Jesus, and we and God gives us a word, or we use the word of God, or maybe he even gives us, uh, 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 you know, sometimes I'll be praying for people, and, and I'll know what kind of spirit it is, and I'll speak to that spirit when there's an unction there. And that, that is so powerful. It destroys the yoke, and that thing must leave. So here we see that Jesus cast out evil spirits and heal the sick with his word. He cast out those evil spirits with his word. Don't ever think that the word of God is not important when it comes to deliverance because it is important. And things we do must be based on the word of God in deliverance because Jesus and his word are one. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You cannot separate Jesus from his word. 
You cannot separate what Jesus did in his word from deliverance. You have to line it all up. And if you get outside of that, then you're going to be over here in a place where God cannot bless your deliverance ministry because you're outside of the principles of the Word of God. It's actually dangerous, okay? Reading the Word of God, listening to the Word of God can bring deliverance. It did for me. When I first got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, I spent literally hours soaking up the Word of God. I never, never did in my life ever go to any person and have them take me through deliverance. Never. Did I have demons? Why influenced by demons? Yes, many, many of them. And multitudes of ways. Because I was so messed up. But my deliverance came between me and God sitting in a room, crying my eyes out in the presence of God, and reading the Word of God. And I just knew that I was being delivered. And I knew that it was a process ongoing, but I was delivered that way. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 says, A son of my, you know, attend to my words, Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart before thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for their life unto the, those that find them, and health and healing and medicine to all their flesh. The word of God has power within it to deliver us from sickness and disease, from demons, from fear, from oppression. I always tell people, are you, are you reading the word of God? Are you in the word of God? A lot of times in the people who need deliverance don't pay attention to the word. They want you to go presto zito, you know. You're set free. It doesn't work that way. you got to get strong in God's Word. Even if you went through deliverance, you need to get strong in God's Word to be able to keep your deliverance, to be able to keep these evil spirits away, and so on. All right, now let's go to the next place, Matthew chapter 8, and let's look down here at verse 28 to one of the, the uh, um, passages of Scripture that we will review as we go that will give us a lot of insight into, into this uh, ministry of deliverance. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gesenerates, there met two possessed with devils. Now, in this particular account, there's two. In, in uh, Mark's account, I believe there's one. So, but uh, probably this is not the only time this happened. You know, there's probably quite a few times where Jesus ran into some kind of these these really, really crazy demon-possessed people. This this here person probably was possessed, spirit, soul, body. Because he was completely gone. You're going to see the signs. Uh, possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, that no man might pass his way. First of all, we see here the tombs, people who are obsessed with the occult, people who are obsessed with darkness, or obsessed with horror movies and tombs and this and that. That's always a sign of demonic activity. I'd keep my kids away from that kind of stuff. You know, some parents say, oh, go ahead and, and uh, watch some of this stuff, you know, Harry Potter and all that. I say, you know, it's, it's, it could be dangerous. And I have a good friend who became um, not heavily involved in the occult uh, and, and had to, you know, uh, go through a nasty uh, time and finally was uh, almost died. Finally was God rescued him, saved him, filled him with the Holy Ghost. He has a wonderful ministry as for many years, but... The truth of the matter is, he. I asked him, I said, how'd that all start when, when you were a kid? He said, well, because my parents weren't there and my parents were alcoholics. And, you know, he says, I just felt completely, um, the way he turned it was, you know, he, he just felt like he didn't have any place. He was empty on the inside. And he really, you know, would, it, he needed something to give him what he would term power. And he's, you know, when he watched Bewitched, the show Bewitched. Now, it's not going to happen to everybody who watches Bewitched, but it did to him. He saw that, you know, her twinkle her nose or whatever it was, and the thing float around and the power that she had. And, and that became an obsession in his life. If I can really gain that kind of power, I can be in control of things. See? That's how the occult catches people. And so um, he got involved in that. And that, that little thing like Bewitched was the start of him going down this long road into almost dying uh, in, an, you know, in the occult world. Verse 29, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Now, the demons tried to get Jesus into a conversation. I want you to see this. Demons will always try to pull you into a conversation because when you're conversing with them many times, they're not leaving. They'll do anything 
anything to try to get you sidetracked from what your job is, which is to cast them out. And there was a good way off from a herd of many uh, swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou castest out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. Now there's a lot of things you can learn from this. Number one, that demons don't like leaving their host. Demons can live in animals. And you can also, if you'll, if you'll note, the influence of demons drives somebody crazy, like this man drove the, the pigs crazy, and they, dr they drowned themselves in the, in the water here. But I also want you to notice, because it's very interesting that you get this, it's important that you get this, that when the demons started speaking out, Jesus didn't uh, even reply to them. Now, in the next thing we're going to find out, he asked them their name, and, he, and the, the name was Legion, for we are many. Why Jesus did that, I suspect, was because when he first commanded them to come out, they didn't. He needed to get to the strong man. Jesus said, unless you first bind the strong man, you'll not spoil his house. Many deliverance ministries don't understand that. I always pray before I go into a service and bind every strong man that might be in somebody. Because then you'll be able to spoil his good. Get rid of the strong man first. Don't go after him last. See? And so... Here's the thing that, that I see in this. this. This guy was loaded with demons. Yes, somebody can have multitudes of demons. But we'll see in the Bible people have thousands of demons. We'll see in the Bible women who had eight or seven or eight demons. We'll see people in the Bible who had one demon. And I am going to tell you this, quite frankly, in many dog and pony show deliverance ministries. They will tell you that all Christians have demons, which is, is, is an error. Foolishness. They're also going to tell you, when they get in there, that there's always going to be more than one. Foolishness. Foolishness. Many times in the Bible, even with the most powerful occultists, you only, only see one. But here, there was more. So there can be more. And so, this person had one demon that was in control. And we're going to find this out, that he had many that came in that probably were subs subordinate to this particular principality. Uh, a low-level devil, but yet, uh, the, the, you know, in the in demon world, just like it is in the body of Christ, there is an authority. And uh, so these many demons found a place to lodge in there, and this one demon was really in control. Get rid of that major one, and the others have to follow, see? And that's a, that's a good biblical prison, pr principle of deliverance. Now let's read on here. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the, people heard, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Now we see where suicide comes from. Suicide, normally a suicide spirit, comes from just the presence of demons. Somebody said, is there literally a suicide spirit? I imagine there is. And uh, just get rid of it. But any presence of any demon will cause somebody to do things like cut themselves. We'll see in the next verse, uh, uh, you know, this cutting, this all this kind of stuff is demonic. Uh, a lot of this piercing stuff is demonic. Uh, it, 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 and their people are almost obsessed with that. Tattooing. I'm telling you, folks. You say, oh, well, you know, Pastor Tom, are you saying people who have tattoos have demons? No, what I'm saying is that people who are obsessed with something like that can. And a lot of times you'll find out that that's a sign that people have issues, deep-seated issues, and many of the times it can be, they need deliverance. And then verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 32, this is very interesting. I want you to listen to me very carefully. And he said unto them, go, one word. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. The swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Now, I understand this is Jesus, but you see here, with Jesus, he can't, you just can't cast out a thousand demons with one word normally. It has to be the gift of special faith. Now, Jesus walked in the anointing fully. He was the body of Christ. We, we don't have that. We have part of that. But the gifts of the Spirit work, and in deliverance ministry, the number one gift that works for deliverance ministry is the gift of special faith. Whosoever shall say unto the mountain, that principle. And it's a supernatural anointing 
that is beyond yourself. I find this comes on me in the presence of these evil spirits many times, and you can cast them out just with a command or a word under the anointing of the Spirit of the living God. That's the number one way that you see Jesus minister to them directly like this. And they that kept, uh, kept them fled and went into the city and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when he saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. Now let's look at this other, uh, we'll look at this other uh, portion of scripture later in another uh, session, Matthew chapter, um, Mark chapter 5, that goes into greater detail along this line because I think it's, it's good to withhold that till later. But the point I want to talk to you about right now is it doesn't matter how many demons there are. We have authority over them. Jesus exercises authority over them. Don't make a big deal out of that. If you make a big deal out of there's more demons, so it's harder, that's what you're going to get. Jesus just got through telling us, as you believe, so be it done unto you. I am endeavoring to build my faith to where one command will work. Now, that doesn't always work that way for me. I haven't always been able to do that, uh, but I'm, I'm working toward that in my faith. I want my, my regular faith to get up that high, to operate higher and higher levels. I remember uh, Lord telling Brother Summerall that he will cat, could, would cast out 10,000 demons in one command on a television show if he would obey God in these areas. I believe it probably happy, happened for him. Um, you know, I've seen such tremendous deliverances just by one word. I remember one lady that was watching the 700 Club, I think it was Pat Robertson years ago, had a word about somebody being a lesbian and, and, and being a, a prostitute on the streets and all this, and, and just spoke one word. And that lady had nine demons come out of her. I remember because I, I ministered with her. Uh, we, we became friends, and, and she would, you know, she, she taught me a lot about ministry to uh, deliverance. And um, this woman, I mean, right there, right through the television, God rolled her down on the ground, and she and these set and these I think it was nine demons came out of her, and her whole life was drastically and radically changed with one command. She didn't have to go through seventeen sessions. Now some people might need to go through more than one session. The word therapy used in in the in the word healing, excuse me, the word healing, the word therapy is used. Rick Renner says that the notes at times that Jesus may have ministered to people more than one time. And I don't think there's anything wrong with us ministering to people more than one time if we do it properly, biblically. Um, and we may have to. But I like it like this. I like it when the Lord comes with great power and anointing and we can dislodge the evil spirits. I like it like that the best, to be honest with you. Now, that's awesome. Go to Matthew chapter 12, or Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. I wanted to point out here that this word power is authority. It is the word that, that, that's, that says Jesus gave them permission to operate in this kind of God-given authority which we all have as Christians. We have God-given authority to be able to defeat anything that God tells us to tackle or anything that he, uh, the unction of the Holy Spirit tells us to pray about. We have that. We have uh, authority. But not everybody has authority to do everything. Uh, there's also another authority that's called power, but the word power is dudamus. So you have two types of authority. You have the authority that God gave these guys, which is which was delegated authority that we all have in Christ. But at times, God also gave his ministers and will give us a authority of power that comes along with an office gift, as an example. And uh, you can't, you know, you just can't flippity do things. You have to have the authority of Christ on you to do some of these things. As an example, uh, dealing with major principalities and powers. I was in, in Panama, Central America. I've been called to go there. Uh, one of the, 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 the places that I minister, that I've been called. I have authority when I go there. I walk in great authority there. When I, when I get down there, I, I get under a tremendous authority. But it's because of the Spirit of God. And my wife and I were down there. We preach at one of the largest churches there sometimes. 
and we're on television there. So sometimes God will give me a word specifically for Panama because many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people will watch that program or listen to it on radio. So when I'm down there, this church has about 30,000 people in it. And I have great favor there. But the thing about it is, is I was sitting there one day and uh, praying about, you know, we we're just praying in my wife. And all of a sudden, I saw in the spirit uh, on a mountain where the flag of Panama is up where we were staying there, this evil spirit that controls, that's been uh, control in Panama, that principality that has been assigned over that nation. And I saw it. The Lord gave me the name of the spirit. It was interesting. I googled it later, found out it, it, it confirmed what I was, what I, what the Lord showed me. I saw many angels going up to this big spirit, and I saw how this 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 evil spirit was really upset because it was it was it wasn't able to move and, and do things like it used to. And that was the impression I got when I saw it. These angels came up and they were taking these little ropes and they were tying them in it. And I, know, I knew it was the prayers of the saints that were binding up. Now, if people say, can you get rid of an evil spirit over a city? No, they don't leave. But what you can do is bind their activity. They, they have a right until Jesus wraps this up to uh, dwell in a certain area. Jesus did not cast those evil spirits out of that man and command them to go to New York City. It doesn't work that way. He just made them leave. They're going to stay in the same area because that is their... Uh, you know, they, they have a right to do that until this lease runs out and Jesus wraps this thing up. Then they're going to have to leave and they'll be put, put in, their, in their final place, the lake of fire. But uh, you can buy in that activity. You can take authority over that activity and make them stop and lose their power and authority. And that's what's happening in Panama, great revival down there. And I saw this and then God gave me the name of the spirit. I looked it up. And it was a, the, the type of spirit it was, or the type of demonic force was, it was a shapeshifter, changed shape. I noticed that the spirit, when I saw the vision, would change to a male form, to a female form, to this form, to that form. Well, that's the history of that country. You know, they're bouncing around politically. You know, they've been this and that, socialists, and they've been, you know, democratic, and they've had dictators, and they're bouncing all over the place. And so I got that vision, but with that vision, see, comes authority. See, I have great authority to be able to speak into the realm of the realm of the spirit. When God when God calls you, not everybody can do it. So I got up on, on Sunday morning and we all spoke to that thing under the unction of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It was a powerful, powerful thing. I was able to share with the people and the pastors of that great country what I saw. And it was a great blessing to them. And uh, they could use it in their prayers. Uh, you see, that kind of thing there is not something everybody can do. Um, so God deals with major principalities and powers many times as the spirit of God wills in these ministry gifts, but you have authority in your own home. You have authority over your children. You have authority to help your church. You have authority in the area God has given you authority. And when you walk according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, wherever he sends you, you're going to have authority wherever he sends you. Amen. But there's two types of authority. There's the a, a given authority that is given to us like a police officer will have will stand out in front of a car and say stop and then you stop because he's backed by a bigger authority which is God if you think about it we uh, have that kind of authority we can make Satan stop because we have that delegated authority but some of us and at times you will have power which is an anointing of authority and that power that comes with the anointing is what comes on us and myself many times in services. And we'll talk about that as we go. We'll see it. Uh, that that just has authority to destroy yokes and set people free from demonic spirits. Now, I'm telling you all this to, to share with you. If you look very carefully at what we're studying, you're going to find out several things. First of all, most of the time when Jesus ministered to the demonic people or people that were demonized, he was in a service, a church service, right? Or he was on a mission trip sent by God to go to a certain town city, like here when he went to the Genetrets overseas. I mean, over the lake, excuse me. 
So you must be sent to have that authority. If you just go, many times people don't understand this. You really don't have that authority, so things don't work. So you need to make sure that if you're in deliverance ministry, God is sending you. But this is something you should be doing. He sent his 10 disciples, or excuse me, his 12 disciples. He sent the 70. And when they went, there was a delegated authority that he gave them. Now, as Christians, we all have a delegated authority to go and minister uh, reconciliation to the people. We all have authority that if we run into a demon, if you run into him, that's a God sign that you've got authority to deal with that situation. You have that authority. Don't misunderstand me here. Any Christian can pray for the sick. But we also want to remember that there is the time where God will say to a certain individual, you go do that. And with that comes authority. And he'll put people in ministry offices. And with that office comes certain authority. The prophet in a certain area will have great authority, a true prophet. A true apostle in a certain area will have great authority because they're called to go as part of their calling. They're sent ones, sent with great authority. Pastors have authority in their town, their city, whatever it is that's greater than the average Christian because of the anointing of power that carries with it the authority. Not just delegated authority, but power authority. Same way with teachers and so on. So it's important that we understand that. Important that we have a balanced understanding. You'll find that Jesus ministered most of the time in church services and when he ran into something like this on a mission trip or when he was out ministering to people in some kind of a meeting format where he was preaching to them and ministering to them. We could call that an evangelistic event or whatever. God does it the same way. It's not just in a counseling session, okay, where most of these deliverance ministry, a lot of them, you know, uh, want to say we just have counseling with people and then we cast out devils. Okay, that may be good, but most of the time, the true authority to, to dispatch these evil spirits comes in when somebody is sent to minister in this type of a setting. Until next time, I love you. Um, and we'll be studying more, so hang in there. you gotta, you going to have to watch all these to get everything. I can't give it all to you in one shot. We love you. God bless you. Keep up the good work.